welcome back to another wonderful episode of the Nonprofit Show, everyone. We're really excited to have Emily Kelly here, one of the national accounts managers with our friends over at Boomerang. Emily, I'm really excited to talk to you about this amazing thing that you all did. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me. What an honor. Well, thank you. You know, um, I've got to just witness to you, and you, you probably don't even know this, but Bloomerang was really one of our very first um, sponsors that we started with. And, uh, you know, everything was shut down. We started because of COVID and uh, we called one of your senior leaders and they were like, well, yeah, let's do something because I can't go anywhere and you can't go anywhere. And so we kind of kicked it off from there and uh, they're still with us. So it's very exciting. The wild times. Yeah, they were wild times. Wild times continue with our friends from Bloomerang. Uh, we've been doing this now five years with more than 1,100 product produced shows. And so never a dull moment. As I mentioned, Bloomerang is one of our valued partners, as is American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new show on Fridays, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out. We also have an amazing assortment of co-hosts that come from all over the country that are super diverse and wonderful. And so I hope you've been able to get uh, been able to get to know them as we have here. Um, they're just amazing. The amazingness continues here with our friend Emily Kelly. Emily, where are you coming to us from? I live in the north side of Indianapolis, like northeast suburbs of Indianapolis. Great. So that's where Bloomerang is headquartered, right? Mm -hmm, correct. So, you know, I am amazed and we talk about this probably more off camera than we do on camera. But, um, you know, Indianapolis has become such a center for tech and, and philanthropic tech and um, just this whole movement towards the digital nature of, of philanthropy. And I know the Eli Lilly School of Philanthropy is there at IU. I mean, there's a lot cooking, but it's really exciting for us to even notice this or see it as far away as we are from other parts of the country. It's exciting for our customer base, too. I think I learned the other day that Indianapolis has more nonprofits per capita than any other city in the country. So it gives us a nice opportunity to get to have us, you know, more familiar local customer base, if at all possible. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's talk about this. I am absolutely riveted by this program or study. I don't even know what you all call it, um, but you've done it before. But this year you've just amplified it. You donated twenty five dollars to 500 nonprofits in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And dare I say, they didn't really know who you were, right? No, not at all. And we, didn't, talk about this. This. we didn't want to, we didn't really want anybody to know. What we did is really just focus as, as a donor. What does that look like? Like take, take our professional hat off and just get behind the screen as an actual donor and then identify that process, identify that giving experience and what occurred for the next 30 days after giving. Um, and just really kind of not look at the website as you know someone that's in this industry all the time, but just mm -hmm. as an average Joe or Joan who's coming to the, the website to, to support a different organization and what that journey looks like. So did you, uh, I have so many questions. <laughs> did you identify a, uh, by a gender? Did you like have a name or how did you do this so that somebody on the other side would know um, who they were talking to? That's a great question. My colleague and predecessor to this program, James Golder, facilitated this entire study. So from my understanding, he did it under, under his name under his name. Okay. So then m moving on to, like I said, I have a lot of questions. Did you figure out um, like different regions of the U S and did you determine that you were going to do different types of sector? I mean, we, we always say there are nine major sectors from animal welfare to education. You know, did you do any 
thing of that nature to stratify those those donations? We did, and me as an, a national accounts manager for the for Bloomerang, we identify and, and work closely with different national accounts such as Boys and Girls Club, Habitat for Humanity, YMCA, um, Humane Societies, and different animal welfare organizations. So um, there's really really focused on those particular groups. And so we tried to branch it out across the country. So if we were giving $25 to 50 different boys and girls clubs, $25 to 50 oh. different habitats, and try to as much as possible get one in every state. Very interesting. So you could actually look at this in a competitive set. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Okay, mm -hmm. so you could see what one group did even with the same branding, but yet they might have a different um, approach. Exactly. And whenever we share these experiences with these various organizations, like say we get to show one or something compared to the other, we're like overall the results were very similar. So we're not saying one organization is necessarily doing it better than another one or not necessarily another organization within the organization is doing something better. The results were all pretty similar across the board. Okay, whew, that's a good thing to have to report out, right? I'm sure yeah. there, I mean, I'm sure that's kind of dicey when you look at something and you're like, okay, yeah, there's a big difference, which we'll get into more as, along this conversation. Um, anything else that you want to share with us? Like, when did you do this? You said you followed it for 30 days in terms of activity. What are mm -hmm. some of the other parameters that occurred? Um, something that's interesting that I always share with whether it's customers or a different organization that falls under this umbrella is the first thing that you can do when you go to your website is literally just hover your mouse over your donate button. Make sure it works. You know, sometimes I think we get really caught up in the job and my job itself or at the at the nonprofit or as a volunteer, whatever the case may be. But if you go to that your website and you go to that donate button and it doesn't work then you're, you're just in a heap of trouble from, from the jump there. So, um, and that did happen, not a lot, but it did happen where that button didn't even work at all. So we could not even, you know, evaluate that specific organization. So always, we always tell the organizations, like, look at your website, not as a member of your organization, look at your website as a donor and try That's to crazy. experience the donation process that way versus, you know, um, an employee. How long did it take you to make these donations in your team? That's a great question. I mean, it's it was a process over a year or so. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of teamwork involved there. Right, right. Amazing. Well, let's let's dig into it even further because I'm absolutely fascinated. First off, what was the response to the gift? What I'm sure incredibly uh, varied. Yeah, very varied. Um, there was different uh, sectors that we investigated, like um, were we sent an acknowledgement or did it just look like a receipt? Um, did it look like a, you know, we paid an invoice or we were we acknowledged? Were we acknowledged by name? Were we acknowledged by gift amount? Were we acknowledged and then told what the gift amount is going to do? Um, were we asked, is it in tribute or memorial of someone? Um, were we asked or forced to cover the processing fees or were we given that opportunity? Um, were we asked to volunteer or see the facilities of the organization or, um, you know, added to a newsletter, things like that. So there are a bunch of different parameters that we had boxes to check for each donation. Wow. What's your general sense of the health of this? Like were people, um, engaged like asked these things like when you you said you had these parameters that you were trying to follow throughout your investigation mm -hmm. what percentage or what did you see were people asking these questions or was it you know uh, really low it was pretty low it wasn't great so there's always you know room for improvement which is exactly why we did this you know just yeah. to just to share that's what bloomerang is about of course we're business but we're also wanting to help nonprofits succeed, do better, be better, raise more money, have more volunteers, get your board involved, whatever the case may be. So we just wanted to use this as a tool to share with any organization how they can do better and be better. 
Yeah. When you think about these thank yous, was there one that stood out um, that was completely unique or did they kind of all row in the same direction? Um, from my understanding, they were all pretty similar. I think, you know, sometimes folks will go that extra mile and they'll do a video thank you, which uh -huh. is always, you know, a nice plus. Something we're really encouraging, I guess would be the word, is um, whenever you're acknowledging your donors, especially that first time donor, is to make a phone call. And we always encourage that because if you make a phone call to a first time donor, they're two to or they're more likely to give another donation in the future versus if you didn't. And if you do it within 24 to 48 hours, that mm -hmm. likelihood increases by about 50%. Wow. Amazing. And again, these are folks that had no idea that, that they were part of of an, and I'm going to use the word investigation, and I don't know if that's the proper word, but, um, you know, part of an action that was really going to be reviewed. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating when I'm at the different conferences for these specific organizations, I'll have a QR code and, you know, allow them to understand what we're doing. And I'll sit down with them and let them know what those results are. Mm -hmm. And it's always like huge eyeballs, like, oh my gosh, you know, this is, great or this is not great or what what great. suggestions do you have that we could do better or be better and we're always really happy to share those results and and give different suggestions sure well you know we work so hard and we think about what we're doing and how we're doing and how does it look and how does it function but the reality is um it's really hard to get this feedback mm -hmm. right i mean unless we're doing it ourselves or we're asking a family member to do it and we're sitting next to them and we're seeing what goes on. How do you ever get this feedback that's real? You don't. And that's something too that we suggest just you hit the nail on the head. If you don't have the time to do it, which I, I was in the nonprofit world for a long time, you wear a lot of hats. If you're not doing one thing, you're doing the next. You don't have time to go to your website and evaluate and do all these kinds of things. So ask your partner, ask your spouse, your sister, a friend, you know, just go to your website and what, what do you think about this? How do you think we could do better? What would make you want to give again? And just maybe, um, you know, reach out or have your volunteers do it, have your board do it. Um, just delegate those responsibilities and it can really, really help you overall with long-term donations and retention. Well, and it's, I think it's pretty magical to think <laughs> that, um, you know, somebody who is not known, is not identified a random gift that comes in what is that experience like you know how frictionless was the engagement on this site i mean to, for you to to call out donate buttons that don't even function that's just heartbreaking that's absolutely heartbreaking right but the reality of that engagement could they understand it could they um you know respond what were the questions what was the journey is absolutely riveting. Um, I'm just so taken with this and I think it's uh, super, super cool. Now let's talk about these key lessons because this is not the first year you've been doing this. You've been doing it over a period of time, but it's grown significantly, mm -hmm. right? We'll continue to do it for more organizations moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about key lessons, one of the first things is just the interface, making sure that it's functioning. I'm kind of curious, like, what are some of the other things that maybe surprised you and your team? Um, I think that it kind of just circle back to what I said earlier about, like, I live in Indianapolis, right? And there's a lot of organizations and we're always given opportunities to donate to different organizations, whether it's at the line at the grocery store or your kid's mm -hmm. school Right. Or, you know, if you have pets or if you have a cancer survivor in your family, whatever, we have a lot of opportunities. So we're encouraged to give at some point to X organization. Mm -hmm. And so once that organization has you and they've received that donation, it's so important to retain that person because if you don't and you don't acknowledge that person and let them know where their dollars mm -hmm. are going or how it impacts the organization or just simply how appreciative you are of your hard-earned money and time that they've taken to give to you, they will go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. It's a missed opportunity. And especially in this case where 
um, this didn't follow um, a community event or a gala or an outreach, um, mail, digital. It was just, if you will, somebody goes into their office and guess what? Money has come in. Right. Um, so that's even more impactful, I think, to say, what did they do when uh, they weren't organized to do something? Right. If that makes sense, right? Yeah. Right. Something else that I share that you know, we are, we're always wanting to appeal to different demographics. And I'm asked that question time and time again, how do I appeal to X demographic or this yeah. demographic? Right. And so I think of, you know, whenever, especially, I don't know, maybe as a female, I lay in bed at night and that's when I remember to do everything right. Like make yeah. the dentist appointment, you know, make the vet appointment, make sure I pick this up for the kids from school, things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're starting to rest. So you think about things and you think maybe in that, that receipt email or that acknowledgement email, there was opportunities like volunteer or this event's coming up or this golf outing's coming up or come check out the mm -hmm. facility. I remember that. And then I'm like, oh gosh, this is the time I can go to that link and I can mm -hmm. sign up for those things. And then in addition to that, was there an opportunity for some kind of digital giving? Was there Apple Pay, Google Pay? Uh -huh. um, is there an opportunity to give that way? Because if I'm laying in bed at night, I sure as heck don't want to go down to the kitchen and get my purse, pull out my credit card. I just want a quick, easy way to make that donation and move on. Yeah, I love that you said that because that's absolutely um, the way to get to that younger demographic. You know, we use the word frictionless, but make it easy and make it consistent um, with the whole process, I think is is something that far too many nonprofits are are not thinking of. I mean, uh, it, shockingly to start with the donation button not functioning and not having been tested, you know, all the way to this this more nuanced way of paying uh, and giving, super, super important. Let's go on to our next question again, um, because I'm, I'm just fascinated by the power of storytelling and those online donations. What are you seeing and how is that actually serving that relationship that starts online. So again, like you were empowered or something pulled your heartstrings to go to this organization in the first place. And when you think about that, it just correlates a bit with storytelling. So we always kind of say like, think about when you went to see a movie or you read a book, there's, there's some key takeaways there. And word of mouth is just another way that you can tell others about where you've given, and then they might be so inclined to give as well. But you want to make sure that that organization is telling you what's going on and they do it thoroughly and wholeheartedly. So when you think about a character, a character in a book or a movie, that's the first person you're going to talk about when you come home from the movie or read the book. And so the character would be who is impacted by the organization. And then you might think of the conflict. What's wrong? What happened? Um, you know, is it who's the bad guy or something along those lines? But like, what is this organization trying to overcome? So if you can really tell a story there, that will really, you know, pull those heartstrings. And um, what is the impact of, of overcoming that conflict and how can you get there? What do you need? What do you have to do in order to overcome that conflict? And then lastly, like, what is the result? So once you've overcome that conflict, how much money did you raise? How many kids did it affect? affect? How many dogs did it feed? Um, was there a thermometer maybe to gauge all of those things? So if you can take those four elements that will really, really engage those donors or future donor donors to understand who you are, what you're trying to do, how you're going to do it and what the outcome is. Right. Making them, making that donor, the hero of, of the story and the outcome, um, I think is just really an important thing. And, and it's something that we haven't necessarily embraced until I think this major influence of the digital uh, nature, you know, it's not about charitable giving as much as I believe it's about impact. That's right. where donors want to make their, their philanthropic investment, if you will. They want to see that they want to see solution um, and, and resolution. So I love that you said that. And I, I would imagine that there's probably a correlation between the sophistication of, the the digital interface and how these organizations were understanding and using that philosophy to what that online donation experience was mm -hmm. did that happen 
Well, is it like we always ask, is your landing page engaging? Is other than just giving, which right. I guess at the end of the day, clearly that's what you want. But are you giving them an opportunity yeah. to sign up for a newsletter? Like what are the next steps so that they continue to stay engaged so that they continue to give to you versus just one flat donation? And then maybe, you know, these folks want to feel like they're part of what you're doing. So give them that, that give them that opportunity. Give them that link to to sign up to be a volunteer or get some boots on the ground to check out the facility, um, whatever it takes to just keep them engaged. Yeah, I love that you uh, bring that up because I think that's, you know, something that we probably um, think is like a down the road thing. And what I'm hearing from you, Emily, is that that can be up front. That can be part of, of the donation and the giving experience. Yeah, we can go back to talking about COVID. Like that was a really strange time. We couldn't be with folks in person. We didn't engage with people in person. So, you know, when we think about just even picking up the phone and saying, hey, Emily, thank you for your X donation. It's really going to help us impact X, Y, and Z. You know, we'd like to keep you updated. What's your preferred method of communication? Are you interested in volunteering? You know, how can we best serve you as a donor? And just engaging on a personal level, I mean, it's like a lost art. And it's a really impactful way to increase your donor retention and to impact your relationship with mm -hmm. your donors. I love that you said that. It's a lost art. And that is so dang true and um, really interesting because it also seems to me, Emily, that this is a a tone at the top kind of leadership thing that, that you're going to have um, to have defined what your response is and, and why you're doing it and how you're doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not just depending on who's in the office that day. Right. You know, I mean, do you, are, did you see that or are you seeing that is more of a concentrated philosophy and effort and actually even plan for navigating these things? Well, we're encouraging it. And, you know, when we're sharing these results, we're like, this is this is a way that we can improve X, Y, and Z. Um, a lot of times, again, like I said, these folks are wearing a lot of hats. I've done yeah. there. I've done it. I've been there. Um, but something that really is helpful is to get your board involved. I think a lot of times we get very inundated with like the ins and outs and the bottom line and how much money are we raising. But we can do that all day. But if we're beating our head against the wall about how much money we're raising, we're not getting to where we want to be. You have to reevaluate, re well, why aren't we and how can we? So a lot of times if you have your board reach out to these folks, they're re-energized and they're reminded why they wanted to be part of the organization in the first place. And then they take those stories and share and they can share with the donors. So it's just a really wonderful way to, to get back in front of people and share stories and communicate. Um, I just I know that when I'm traveling and I get to be with people in real life and I get to hear these stories and I have folks come up to me crying about X, Y and Z. It's just all the more impactful. And I remember those things and I carry it with me and share it. And then hopefully that will entice someone to support that organization moving forward. Right. You know, I, I can say personally that some of the most profound things that I've done is, is in, board, in terms of board service um, has been that quote unquote, thankathon, where you show up or you're given a list and you just make, you know, 10 to 15 phone calls and it, they are nothing more than a thank you. Um, you. You know, you're not equipped to take money or a donation. I mean, you can funnel that information to somewhere else, but literally it is a moment of gratitude. And, and when you respond, when you hear the responses, um, and it's like, I'm not here to ask for money. I just want to thank you. No, and exactly. people are like, wow, or, you know, I should give you more money or I mean, whatever it is. That's the goal, right? And just to make yeah. them feel like they're part of what you're doing. When I talk about phone calls, sometimes I um, people look at me like I have seven heads, like a phone call. Who makes phone calls anymore? And I think that's kind of part of the appeal is that we're also inundated with text messages, which I'm not knocking. I think is a very impactful way to get donations or emails or whatever the digital arena is that you're making your asks, but I'm not getting any phone calls from anybody and probably not going to answer the phone on that first ring. I'm going to look, who is this? 
And I'm not telling people to call seven times a day or seven times a week right. or anything. But I was in advertising for a minute in my life. And there was something that we learned is that that old adage of seven, you have to see something or hear something seven times in order for it to stick. Like we all have that 1-800, whatever the case may be for a lawyer or what a product that we remember for the rest of our life because we heard it seven times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're on our phone and we see over time that person has called us. We're probably going to listen to that voicemail or then maybe eventually pick up the phone and start a conversation with those folks. And you realize, hey, this organization really took the time to pick up the phone, acknowledge, you know, that I gave, how much I gave and where it's going and how it's going to impact others. Yeah. Well, I think you used this this great analogy in the very beginning of our conversation about, you know, how do we connect with people and how we've been removed from that. And when you get that proximity and the power of a voice or just that actual, um, you know, human contact, even if it's just through the phone, um, that spikes up the, the situation, right? I mean, it really does amplify what that relationship is, how that relationship might go. Um, fascinating stuff. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And I think that, yeah, Emily, I, I think this is one of the most um, interesting things that's done in our sector. And I really applaud Bloomerang for, for doing this. I remember in the very beginning uh, of Bloomerang's days when Stephen Shattuck, um, one of your legendary leaders, did this um i think he did ten dollars to ten different organizations like the first year or something and then he kept bumping it up and then he you know would come on and talk about what had gone on and it was riveting mm -hmm. riveting and so i love that you're up to 500 different organizations um for for us to understand and learn thank you so much of course stay tuned for more we'll continue to do it and you know, reach out to us. We're happy to share those specific reports. If you're with a specific organization, we can share those details with you. Um, it's just, it has been a, a riveting study and it's very eye opening. And we really hope that everyone takes it as a way to, you know, do better, be better, raise more money and, and connect strong, more strongly with your donors and supporters. Yeah, absolutely. Super profound lessons to learn from this. Emily Kelly, National Accounts Manager with Bloomerang. You can learn more on bloomerang.co. You know, one of the things, Emily, you brought this up. Um, and again, when we introduced you, um, your organization is remarkable about sharing. You don't have to be a customer of theirs to get basically an MBA and how to, to, to run a nonprofit. I mean, <laughs> amazing content that you have uh, white paper studies you have a vast and robust um, educational component where you have different thought leaders teaching um, it's really an amazing resource and so i i recommend this to everyone no matter what level that they're at and if they think they're in fundraising or not you are in fundraising right right everybody's in fundraising and so to learn about what goes on and, and what the current thought um train is, is is super important so check out bloomerang um dot com again bloomerang is one of our partners and they have been with us from the very get-go um when when i personally believed that that the nonprofit show would be like a two-week gig and here we are you know five years and 1100 episodes on uh, but they've joined us in partnership with the American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. Again, this has been so much fun, Emily oh, Kelly. Right. I'm so appreciative. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, a lot of fun. And we're going to keep um, our fingers on this. And, and as you get more information or new things coming um, your way, let us know so we can share that back out because it's just absolutely fascinating. And I believe, Emily, this has got to be something that we all need to be following along and thinking about so that we can learn for our own organization. Super powerful. Thank you so much been a lot of fun. Hey, as we end every episode of the nonprofit show, we like to leave you with this message and it goes like this to stay well. So you can do well. See you back.